There we go. Now, let's see. Yes. The, yes, Jeff Goldblum as Grandmaster B, stands for Brother of an Idiot, of the Knights Templar. He is one of the elders of the universe, and he's fascinated with gaming and chance. He rules the planet Sakaar, and yeah, Goldblum describes the character as a hedonist, a pleasure seeker, enjoyer of life and tastes and smells. And let's see. I guess that brings us to characters and neutrals. Loki, the, let's see, yeah, Loki is not real happy about, catch, you know, catching up with Hulk, of course, and yeah, we see what's happened as, you know, he's, been ruling Asgard since the end of Thor of the Dark World. And yeah, he's devoted most of his efforts to narcissistic self glorification, not so much on good governance. And yeah, Hillsland never conceived of Loki's emotional connections to Odin or Thor as malevolent. He just wants to have a go on the throne, which he does. And yeah, he becomes king of Asgard, everything's great, it's a good party, but he fails to realize the threats that were just over the horizon, Hela being the biggest and most terrible one of all. And yeah, and Hiddleston said, the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. So the idea that Thor might be indifferent to Loki is troubling for him because that's a defining feature of his character. I don't belong in this fam in family. My brother just loved me. I hate my brother. And the idea his brother's like, yeah, whatever, is an interesting development. And Loki does get at least one action scene, as you see in the trailers. And, you know, I was wondering if Loki was making someone very desperate or, you know, worked with because someone is very desperate, like the Avengers and Thor 2. And there's literally a line where he says something like, you must be desperate to do this thing, you know, not, you must be desperate to get to do this thing, for this thing, and, yeah, I was like, is that an intentional nod to, yeah, because it's a way to keep having him in the movie, and, you know, making some kind of interesting connection between characters, and, yeah. And, yeah, Tessa Thompson as Malachary, tough, hard-drinking, you know, and the, excuse me, Thor movie slash drinking joke will be about her this time. <laughs> excuse me, like it was Volstagg in The Dark World. Excuse me. And one of, you know, some sometimes it is, but there's, you know, we, we get, well, the, 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 the cam, the Steven, the cameo in the, with Stephen Strange, that was actually, Wait, yeah, it must have been the Stran the Stephen Doctor Strange movie that Thor had a cameo in in the in one of the post credit scenes. Yeah, so that it wasn't both of them having a cameo in someone else's movie. Yeah. Anyway, let's see. I've only seen Tessa Thompson in Heroes. And then, you know, she smiles, very peppy, at times it seems like her face can't help but smile. She can also go dark, badass, emotional. And personally, I don't mind that she's, you know, the person of color playing a Norse character didn't mind it about when I heard it about Heimdall either, nor has it started to bother me. And, yeah, she's, she's great in this. She's very different from a hero. She's a very... A damaged character. Yeah, Natalie Portman's Jane is not in this, and you know, there's kind of a thing between Thor and Valkyrie, but it's not really 
much. Yeah, I, I don't think, you know, people going to watch this movie, go, going to see this movie and like figuring that that'll be a big thing. Yeah, don't don't count on it. You know, the, the movie, comic book movies with like romantic interest, they've gotten very direct and very like comfortable with the idea that a regular person can date a superhero without it being like the end of the world. But yeah, in this one, I mean, they have she's as guardian, and you know he can help comfort her, help heal her pain, because Thor is very stable. So, it, it makes a lot of sense, and they do have a good amount of screen time. I, I don't think that they should really have advertised it as if, oh, there would be a romance between the teeth. There really isn't. They're friends. That's all. And... Yeah, but you know, when I thought that it was that they were gonna be in a relationship, I was like, they're gonna have to work really hard to get me as invested in their relationship as I was in Thor's and Thor and Jane's. They're not quite as many as Spider Man Peter Gwen, but they just fit together so well and Foster and Thor have broken up between films. That's so they were together and it was so amazing at the end of the Dark World. He was beaming with pride at her accomplishments in Age of Ultron. And now they broke up off screen. I just feel like... Could they not have just filmed... You know, for, just get that shot for safety. Just have a brief exchange where, like... Actually, maybe... Yeah, maybe right after... The, he he comes to her and they embrace in the post credit scene of Thor the Dark World. Maybe have him actually, the one of them actually bring up that maybe they shouldn't be together. And then we only see that part in this movie as like a flashback, which would retroactively, that, that would retcon the the thing about him being proud of her accomplishments in Age of Ultron as him covering that's why she's not there it's not that oh she's off doing this super important thing it's because they're not together anymore and he doesn't he can't admit that to the the other members of the team because Thor actually lost something that would be so much more compelling than this i mean they don't even they don't even say why they don't even spend a few words saying, it's just, nope, Jane dumped him, and he's like, we, I dumped her too, it was, it was a mutual dumping. Which is a little funny, but it doesn't, yeah. And the IMDb trivia will point out, it will be the first Thor movie without Jane Foster and her team, which has infuriated many fans of the Thor-Jane romance, and the comedic pair of Darcy and Eric Selvig. And, yeah, I was one of them. I have come to accept it now, but it's still, yeah. Now, the first two made sure to show the non-part, non-hero characters trying to get people away from the danger, especially still in Skarsgård. Stars. Skarsgård. And I have no excuse for not being able to pronounce his name. You know, I'm, I'm not Swedish, oh goodness. But Scandinavian, so yeah. I'm kidding, Swedes are cool. Now, the, 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 yeah, this one does indeed show characters trying to get non-powered, you know, people to safety, and I greatly appreciated that. That is something that would be terrible to, to lose. I mean, you could argue that really most of the MCU tries to at least this, no, 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 we're, you know, we're trying to, you know, reduce collateral damage. We're trying to keep civilians safe, you know, but not all of them do, and certainly not all of them make as much of an effort as the first two Thor movies. Now, this one really liberates itself from the entire 
you know, him going to Earth and being on Earth thing. The yeah, it's it's set. It's you know, some of it is on Asgard, a lot of it's in on Sakaar. The movie does not spend a lot of time. You know, you already know there'll be at least a little bit on Earth. The whole strange thing, but yeah. Now. But, yeah, you know, when, when I saw the promotional materials, I'm like, where's where the human supporting cast of the first two? You know, Jane Foster, Eric Selvig, Darcy, Marcy, Darcy, Marcy, that's what I'm going with. And yes, I did write that joke before I got the full Married with Children box set and started rewatching for thoughts and review. Now, that is it for this part, so let's see if we can open, there we go. Thoughts. Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Starting with notes taken while watching. I was never a fan of the Warriors 3 in the movies. I mean, I barely read any Thor comics. I really do feel like this kind of craps all over them. I mean, I mean at, least, at least Hogan got a little bit more screen time than he has before. And got to be a little bit more badass. But, I mean, the first two, all you have with them, I mean, Volstagg, they almost might as well have like shot him from behind and had some extra don the costume or something. But I mean, all that you have with that is that Volstagg made sure to be ready for Thor's return, and then you know Fandral's right there, and Fandral at least get this gets this slightly heroic moment where he's going up to attack her. But yeah, I liked that we saw. I want to say it's M Muspelheim. It's been a while since I, I'm not as familiar with that part of Norse myth. You know, Jotunheim, Asgard, Midgard, th those are the ones I'm primarily familiar with. But, yeah. I, I like that the movie didn't spend, like, forever explaining about Muspelheim and then having him... No, you just you start there, and Thor gets explained, you know... This is the source of my power. Oh, so that's what I have to grab. Okay. Because there's no reason to spend forever. The, the whole point of that first scene is things have changed in Asgard. Here's a really powerful, you know, this is, this is the source of Surtur's power. And Thor ends the, the scene by going to Asgard and, you know, taking with him the source of Surtur's power. Both of those two things are, of course, very important. Now... Let's see if I can do better at filling the otherwise dead air than I was in the main review, including when I was going off notes not written specifically on the pages. And here we go. The Yeah, we find out that Odin being alive, that, you know, the magic that he could still use, even as he was dying, kept Hela at bay, but now that he's dying, there's nothing to keep her, yeah. I do think that maybe that could have been a little strong, like, I wasn't entirely certain where it was she had been, or what exactly, like, okay, so she's been using a lot of her power trying to get back, but Odin's magic was too strong for her to break through. 
Yeah, I, th I feel like a little bit more. And when Mjolnir breaks, the tip of my pencil does as well. The, you know, the it has the, the 3D sticking out of this. I thought that was cool. I mean, that's the kind of thing where you want to. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's dying. I really exp what on earth did I write there? The the We did not see Sif. I thought that she was gonna be killed off, but Maybe that was specific, like, she found out that she would only be in the movie long enough to be killed off, so, yeah. And I liked that, you know, it's by being knocked out of the Bifrost beam that they end up on Sakaar. That, yeah, you know, makes a lot of sense that that's how that sort of thing happens, that, yeah. And I like the reveal that Hela was Odin's firstborn, so she was expecting to become queen. It's not just she came from this place and she wants to rule. No, legitimately, she want, she expected to be the one in power. And then Odin is like, I can't have someone like her rule. And he takes that away from her. And, you know, yeah, that's different from the other relationships. The, you know, when the, when, excuse me, when Odin exiled Thor, he didn't make it possible for him to return. You know, the hammer is there. And he didn't do that for Hela, you know. So there was clearly, yeah. And... Yeah, Hela slaughtering Asgard guards was really, really cool. I th yeah, I don't think the movie ever goes wrong when it has a bunch of faceless guys go up against at least one character who's really powerful. That's always cool. And, you know, seeing Hela on um, Fenris... In, in first just in the paintings really really cool and I I've been I've been theorizing for years and I'm really glad to have it confirmed yeah the gauntlet in the it's it's fake it's not the one Thanos uses you know so I, I really and and just so gleefully like fake most of the stuff in here is fake just that was really funny I mean I hated the thing in Iron Man 2 where it's like, do you know what that is? Oh, yeah, it's the solution. It's like, look, if you didn't want people freaking out and going like, that's Captain America's shield, when it was in the background of the first one, don't put it in the background of the first one. But this actually had just... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I can completely put words to it, but it's just here it really absolutely 100% works for me. And you know they're they're talking about you know oh the eternal flame and then pops on close your eyes gnarling and you know she brings back to life Fenris and all these warriors the the kind of zombie like warriors and those are also I mean at the end of the day the 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 enemies are the enemy goons are faceless in all three Thor movies, but here I thought they were cooler than. Oh, I find all of them cool, really, to be honest. But I, yeah, I like them in this. Maybe also because there is this sense of like she's she's raising the dead, and yeah, that really works with this whole you know, the world is ending kind of motif. The dead will rise and the living will die horribly. You know, and again, they fit in the first two as well. Now, 
I like that Hulk smashes Thor like Loki, and they actually legitimately did have, like, yeah, Loki is like, yeah, that's how it feels. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just a big fan of this sport. And, you know, Thor tries the, the Black Widow thing. The sun's getting real low. You know, come to, yeah, I, I like that. And I'm sorry, that also just addresses something that, I mean, the movie doesn't spell it out. But, you know, I, I just, you know, Doug Walker, back when I still watched anything of his, I still sometimes rewatch them for, you know, in, in research for these, just to see if I missed anything or such. He said that, oh, you know, Black Widow knows how to do it, but she doesn't teach the rest of the team. Maybe it's a specific connection between the two of them. Maybe it's specific, you know, just just because one person can do it doesn't mean that anyone else would be able to. It's just, yeah, the the... You know, that's the thing about her and about spies. When when you're not realizing that they're incredibly dangerous, they can be really soothing. They make you relax. That's what they do. They make you relax so that you make mistakes. You know, it's, none of the others are going to do that kind of thing for him. And, yeah. And then you also have the thing of, like, it's, you know, she's an attractive woman doing that to a man and... Yeah, you know, if there's anything that can calm down an angry man, it's an attractive woman speaking very soothingly and calmly to him and, like, approaching him even though he is angry and, yeah. And, and I like that, you know, even early on we see some lightning without the, without Mjolnir. I really felt like, and I, I went a little bit into this in the in, in the non-spoiler part in the review itself, I really feel like this should have gone into why was Hulk attacking Thor? Why did he kill the other? You know, when, when Korg is like, I mean, at that point we're not supposed to realize that the champion, the reigning champion is Hulk, but he specifically says, you know, anyone who fights him dies. And the movie doesn't have Thor ask, Hulk, why did you kill those other gladiators? And there could have been, like, this moment where Hulk is like, all I know how to do is destroy. And they kept cheering me on, so I, could, I just couldn't stop. Or maybe it's, may, maybe mix in, or, or maybe instead of this, this thing of, like, if I hadn't killed them, I would have been killed for showing mercy. You know, I, I didn't have a choice. But no, instead, they just, you know, he, he yells about being angry and he throws some stuff at Thor. Again, I like those scenes, but I, I could have loved them and I should have loved them. And the movie just didn't. Yeah. I like the thing with, you know, the sword is missing, and then you see, you know, it's Heimdall who got the sword back, and the thing. You had one job! <laughs> and, you know, we have nude Hulk, and, yeah, you know, go ahead and theorize if, you know, is he equipped in a manner fitting his overall size, or, you know, there's that college humor video where, you know, the, the, Climax, as it were, was, wow, that's the smallest one I've ever seen. And he's like, oh. And, you know, you have the, the citizens of Asgard, basically refugees. You know, they're hiding and fleeing. And I don't know if that was meant to, like, make you realize, you know, make... make cynical people realize that they themselves could be refugees, that the refugees are just people like them, you know, but yeah, I appreciate that it wasn't just this easy, 
yeah. And, you know, they do go some into Hulk, you know, is like he hates Earth and he's he's sad and he chose exile so that yeah. And you know, the thing about how Valkyrie went up against Hela and just barely survived and yeah, you can understand why she lost faith in Asgard. And you know, you have the Black Widow hologram in Age of Ultron and it you know yeah, it actually does end up calming Hulk down to the point of being Banner again. So yeah. She doesn't even have to touch him, she doesn't even have to be physically present to calm him down like that. So yeah. I really like the knife fight between Valkyrie and Loki. We have not before seen enough of Loki's skills with a knife and actually having, you know, by then we know that Valkyrie is good with a knife, so, yeah. Now... What does that mean? What on earth did I write? Never mind. And supposedly it was the Quinjet that Hulk managed to take to Sakaar. And, you know, people have been talking about and Nerdist News talked about this. It's just how did he manage to? The Quinjet isn't supposed to. Was, was the Quinjet equipped to travel beyond Earth's atmosphere? It was, it was a jet, not a shuttle. So, yeah, I, I wish that there, there had been another... Just have him, like, somehow be moved through space, not flying through space. Yeah. And, you know, we have Bruce scared to hulk out, so, you know, that he won't become Banner again, and, yeah. And they go some into Hulk hating Banner, and vice versa. And I like, you know, Thor tossing things at the Loki hologram, and, you know, then later he tosses something at the actual Loki just to test, and, yeah. And the, the devil's anus was kind of funny, and then the things, I will travel through the anus. And, you know, you have the revolution, which is also in the comic. And, yeah, I, I quite appreciated that. And Thor and Loki's escape is a lot like the those scenes in Thor the Dark World. And, I, again, I feel like it's... Like, again, I enjoyed the scenes, but I feel like it's like the opening fight of the first Thor movies being so similar in this movie when he's in Mus Muspelheim. Just, which, you know, the, the Thor-Loki escape in the second movie isn't very much like anything in the first movie, so, yeah. Now. Let's see. And I, I like the bit about how originally Odin was war hungry and Hela was his weapon. And then he changed his mind and suddenly she is no longer desirable. He, he doesn't want her around at all. You know, it's not just you will not be queen. It's you are banished from Asgard and I will trap you, you know, and that retcons that in the first two movies when Odin was trying to talk Thor out of war and I mean they even they quote him in this both of them heard excuse me him say you know wise king doesn't you know in both of those movies Odin was thinking oh no 
he's like hella. And in the first one, he's just, he gives Thor the means to redeem himself by putting the hammer also on Earth and putting it so close. You know, I mean, he doesn't have to, like, travel around the world to get to Mjolnir. No, it's a few miles away, you know, outside of town. And the, you know, which which means, I mean, if he put the two right next to each other, the Thor would just immediately pick it up. But no, he has to prove, he has to actually go there, you know. And in the second movie... You know, you don't quite have any, but when, yeah, you know, ultimately, I mean, he doesn't, he could have, like, done more to prevent Thor. So, on some level, again, he doesn't think that it's quite that bad. I have to admit, it's super dark, but I did really enjoy, and everyone else in the theater laughed their asses off, too. When... Bruce jumps out of the plane towards Bifrost, and he's expecting that Hulk will take over from the from the fear, the tension of the situation, and from a sense of self-preservation, and the land as Hulk. But nope, he just smacks right down. His, and like, I mean, at the end of the day, we know that that's not that doesn't mean that Bruce Banner is now crippled for life. Obviously, Hulk is going to take over and he's going to heal. But it's so funny because it is like, I mean, and they even, in, in The Incredible Hulk, they do bring that up. Like, what, what if you don't turn in time? You're, you're going to be mush on the, on the pavement, you know. But here they actually do go through with that. That, that was really funny. And... You know, and, and Fenris and Hulk are fighting, and Fenris actually, t you know, he doesn't take a bite out. He doesn't manage to. Although he does, you know, manage to go through some of Hulk's skin, make him bleed. That was really cool. But yeah, he tries to bite Hulk's arm, which I thought was really cool, because in the Norse mythology, the the, you know, he's not in any of these movies, but one of the Asgard, one of the main major gods is Tyr, who's the god of war. And Tyr is missing an arm. He's missing an arm because he became close to Fenris when Fenris was small. And he could kind of, you know, and they would play together, and, and Fenris was basically like a dog, like tame, but he is a wolf, and he keeps growing bigger, so they decide they're going to chain him, and in order to calm him down enough to not struggle against being chained, Tyr agrees to put his arm inside Fenris, Fenris's mouth, and, and Fenris has, like, his jaw completely open, and I believe... It's because one of the links in the chain are not perfectly, you know, yeah. I, I forget. I, I don't really know what it's called in English, but yeah, you know how you you, you know you make chains. One of them isn't completely perfect, and the moment that Fenris feels that, he like out of shock, not out of spite, instantly bites down, a reflex, and Tyr loses an arm there. And, yeah, that's why he doesn't have an arm. So, him chomping down on Hulk's arm like that, very nice reference. It's like Hogan and Moon, and, you know, it, it makes sense for that to be, you know, we do actually see Hogan and Moon in, in, the, in Thor The Dark World, but in Avengers, when Thor and Loki are talking, we hear ravens, and it's like, that's Hogan and Moon, and that's Odin watching what's going on, trying to figure out, you know, for, for those who don't know, that's, I believe that's one of the reasons that Odin, in, you know, in, in Thor 1, we see that Odin loses an eye fighting the, the ice giants, frost giants, yeah. In mythology, he gives up an eye for wisdom, 
And I think one of the things that comes with that, but it might be something that I, for, I forget, it's been ages since I read these, but he gets information about what's going on in the world from these two pet ravens, Hoogan and Moonen. And yeah, in the dark world, you literally see them landing on his arm, ready to give him information. So yeah, although you know, it doesn't make it clear that that's what's happening. But yeah, when it, Thor sees Odin and he's like, "What are you, the god of hammers?" It's like it is a little like the power was in your heart the whole time, and that's yeah, really cheesy. But yeah, really badass thunder without the hammer, and just again the the bit where he's killing one zombie after another with the lightning. And yeah, that was awesome. And oh yeah, and and the thing with you, know, what are we gonna do? I'm not doing get help. That was, yeah, funny. I liked that Scourge got to redeem himself. I really like how, yeah, like Alice says, you're a survivor. He's not evil, but he does feel like he wants, he just wants to be on the winning team. And then there at the end, he realizes that he can choose to sit there and save his life or he can choose to sacrifice himself in order to actually, well I guess you know, he wouldn't necessarily be saving his own life either, but he does actually, he doesn't like stand on the plane and just attack, no, he jumps out and when he realizes he for sure won't be able to make it back, he's not like, oh son of a, no, he's like, this is my decision, you know, really wish his redemption did not involve this really cool use of these fully automatic human guns, you know, that really, you know, I'm, I'm just like, oh, they sell bump stocks in Asgard as well, you know, and I mean, it's so... This was what he was bragging about earlier in the film, you know. Earlier in the film, it's like, ah, oh, look at, look, at, you know, I'm showing her, her my trophies. And then later it becomes the tools of his redemption. But it just had to, yeah, just, you know what? The movie was released really close to the Las Vegas shooting. I'm not certain that they would have been able to comfortably edit it out, you know, reshoot. I mean, what do you do if you don't have Scourge redeem himself like that? What, does he just disappear near the end of the film? And, you know, when he is, like, bragging, if, if you cut that out, I don't know, maybe they had something to replace it with. But otherwise, it seems like a really abrupt cut. But I do feel like it was a... It's not good that it's still... And, you know, you have Hulk attacking Surtur, even though he really shouldn't, you know. I, I, you know, that was also a thing. When you see it in the, in the trailer, you're like, oh, man, we're going to see Hulk fighting Surtur. And it's like, nope. And, and the thing with, you know, yeah, the damage is not too bad. Okay, now the foundation is gone. Never mind. And it also, it, it got a laugh just him saying, the damage isn't that bad, you know, because it is, wow, Mr. Glass half full. There really is nothing that's going to, oh, okay, fair enough. When the foundation is destroyed, then you agree that it's, okay, now it's, this situation cannot be salvaged anymore. And, you know, I really like that bit where, like, Loki is going in there for shorters, and, and then it's like, he passes the Tesseract, and then it cuts. So, yeah, he got the Tesseract, and he hid it, and he has it at the end of the movie, and the, the, one of the two, you know, yeah, the, the mid credit scene, 
That's one of Thanos' ships. And Thanos is going to be like, Loki, you promised that you would get me the Tesseract. And Loki's like, here it is. I know it took longer, but here it is, you know, and yeah. Which it's going to have Thor like, I thought, I can't believe you, Loki. Well, I can believe you, but I'm still really frustrated. And, and then, you know, you have like, what do you think? Oh, he's dead. I stepped on him and I felt bad, so I carried around his body. Oh, he's alive. Wow. Talk about Guardians of the Galaxy enemy. That really is. Yeah. And, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. They're not... They're, they're not as funny and quirky and weird as in that. I mean, the whole thing with Korg is just that he's... He looks like he'd be really dangerous, but he's actually super friendly and soft-spoken. You know, I'm sorry, that has nothing on Groot or Rocket. Or... Yeah, the, the others. Sorry, mind blanking. But yeah, that was the mid-credits scene. And you have the post-credits scene. That's really funny. Grand Master, you know... His ship crashed. He was, of course, leaving because he could tell where things were going. And he's like, you know what? Pat yourselves on the back. Oh, no, I... You know what? You wouldn't have been able to do it if I wasn't, you know. A big part of a revolution is the leader you're revolutionizing against. Let's call it a tie. Wow. You know, I... Grandmaster, you are you ain't talking your ass out of yeah. Just you know, he's he's like please do not pull a French Revolution on me. That that would that would suck. And I suppose that that covers all the notes that I made, it would appear so. So Moving on to on plot. I wasn't sure if Yormund Gondor or the Midgard Worm, as I know it, would be in this. It's too bad it isn't, but I'm not sure that would really have been room. But I'm really glad that Fenris was. And, you know, and, and the bit where he, like, grabs the, the jaws and, like, to pull apart. Yeah, that's very... And, you know, Hela stops and then destroys Mjolnir. Didn't even break a sweat. You know, at least Curse looked like it took some strength, but... Yeah, you know, I, I really appreciate it. and and you realize that that's because she easily wielded it before, you know, and at the time, I guess, I guess maybe originally he who is worthy didn't mean he who is a good person who as an individual actually shows empathy originally it meant he who is a fierce enough warrior and you know it it now means you have to have empathy but I guess Hela was grandfathered in I don't know but yeah you know and she destroys it because she doesn't need it she she's got weapons now that yeah and yeah you know seems like that means he does not have it in Infinity War. You know, it was a huge plot point in Thor, in Thor 1, Thor 2 saw it, you know, little in action, kind of written out of it, so I guess they didn't really know how or want to use it much. It was useful in Avengers 1, Age of Ultron, and, you know, Hela laying waste to Asgard, Really, she wins part way through the film, uh, Dark Knight Rises, and yeah, I appreciate that. It was the the 
Yeah, she she wins, and then it is actually yeah, it's very dark in Arises because then you have the refugees hiding, and then she really closes in and tries to find them, and yeah. Don't get me wrong, I, I like Dark Knight Rises better than this, but yeah. And, you know, the... the There were some theories about maybe she would have the last Infinity Stone. You know, the, the orange fire that she creates near the... Yeah, that, that is used near the end of the film, but... And, and yeah, that would mean that these last films, and arguably the first one in the post credit scene with the Tesseract, they realize that Casket isn't an Infinity Stone. It is one of the only major, hugely powerful, non-Terran artifacts in the MCU that isn't one at all. Anyway, each Thor film introduces at least one Infinity Stone each, which, which makes sense since they're such a big part. In the first introduced in the MCU of the cosmic MCU, but yeah, it turned out not to be... I guess, I mean, there are still two left, aren't there? Will both of them be introduced in Black Panther? I mean, that is the only one remaining before Infinity War. Maybe Infinity War will introduce the last one or two, but yeah, I mean, let's see. We have the Tesseract, we have Thor Scepter, which is now in Vision's head, forehead. We have the ether. We have the the eye of Agamotto, and that covers the ones we've seen. And as far as I know, there are six, not only five. There's one for each finger on the on the knuckles, and then there's one in the middle. So yeah, you know, one of them is orange. So, hence, you know, the orange fire, or maybe, like, Heimdall's eyes was another theory. Again, I believe Nerdist News was the ones. Was the where I saw it. I don't know if others theorized that well. But, yeah, you know, I figured maybe it would be revealed at the end with a casual line, goes something, something, Infinity Stone, and, you know, invokes a gas, because I really genuinely love when they do that, and... Yeah, you know, if there are two, maybe there would be two lines like that. That would be so much fun. And the second time, there would be two, you know, two in one film, since Avengers 1 had both the Tesseract and Loki's Scepter, but the first film to show more than one in action. And, you know, whenever else we've seen more than one, only one of them was in use as that kind of, yeah. Well, yeah, I know, technically in the first Avengers movie, yeah. But, yeah, another thing was maybe Thor would use the Tesseract. You know, that was the reason for the glowy eyes and the lightning and such. But, yeah, no, that's because he can use the light. I do really appreciate that he still he can still fly. He can still use lightning even without Mjolnir. So, ultimately, what it cost him was Mjolnir as this throwing weapon that always returns to his hand and the really powerful bashing instrument. I do really love when he, you know, for a little, for a second there, I was like, is he doing this just to screw with Strange because Strange gave him a hard time over Loki, you know, when he's like, you know, Okay, let me just call back my umbrella, and it was also funny. Like, nice umbrella, you know, just hang up the umbrella there, and it still makes the Mjolnir noises. So it is like, you know, I guess Strange just made it up here as an umbrella instead because it did, did still have the qualities of yeah, and I also really liked when. You know, Thor places Mjolnir inside the mouth of the thing, you know, to weigh it down. Also, possible reference to the first Thor movie. Now. And, yeah, Nerdist also suggested that, you know, maybe, you know, Thor would grab the Infinity Stone from the Tesseract and. 
Thor freeing the stone from the Tesseract was signaled to Thanos its location, hence him finally, but yeah, not so. Now, another thing I wondered was, would the movie do something very different for the franchise and series? You know, series especially as the third film about the character, which truly should do. Iron Man 3 did it, The Dark Knight Rises did it. As much as people hated not getting what they had seen, had gotten used to in the first two, I maintain it was the right way to do it. You start a trilogy, and then you do an adventure on part two, and finally you bring it all back to the start, you subvert expectations, you give less of the protagonist in the suit. Seriously, did you don't think we got a ton of Iron Man slash Batman in the suit in part two of those trilogies? And yeah, you know, I, I'm not I'm not saying Iron Man 2 isn't I used to really, really dislike it. Ultimately, it's just, it's just okay. It's just that that feels such, like, such a letdown after the first one was so amazing. But, yeah, you know, that doesn't mean that Part 3 didn't close out the trilogy. And, yeah, you know, the trailer made me think, you know, little to no Asgard or Earth, Thor losing Mjolnir is kidnapped. In the first two, he's his own man, although he is humbled. Here he fights for the entertainment of people he doesn't even like. I think the, the twin swords were used fairly well. The, the basic... I mean, yeah, you know, he has his hair cut, and he... He's fighting an Asgardian, you know, which technically Loki... He was raised as an Asgardian, but ultimately he was a frost giant. You know, not even part, for, you know, I, I believe in the Norse myth, he was at least part, like, it yeah, wasn't it a thing where, like, Odin had sex with a frost giant or something? Or, or maybe, I, I don't think it was two frost giants, at least. I think it was a frost giant and then some other, you know, but... Yeah, you know, Hela is an Asgardian, and you also have Valkyrie, who's, you know, she's not a villain, she's not Hela, but she did go away from, she did leave Asgard, and this sort of thing, and, you know, Thor does not all fight with, you know, together with the Warriors 3, and... Jane is gone, that is a difference from the first two, and yeah, I think it did a reasonable job of this kind of subversion. Now, in the story trailer, they talk about that, you know, Thor wanted an adventure. Well, at the end of Thor the Dark World, sure, but at the end of Age of Ultron, he was very specifically going off to find out what's going on with the Infinity Stones. And I was like, did they forget that? Age of Ultron came out in 2015, Dark World came out in 2013. Now, Ragnarok, you know, I was wondering, will it, you know, would it live up to the nightmarish visions Thor saw in Age of Ultron? The ones that convinced him he would lead all of Asgard to hell if he weren't able to stop it. Where he saw a blind Heimdall who strangled him that led him to leave the Avengers in order to find out how to stop it. Had him revisit Selvi, see a vision in a cave. And, you know, I was also wondering if we were going to see more of that. You know, a deleted scene has him possessed by one of the water spirits mentioned. You know, I'm not sure that's canon because it is a deleted scene, but, you know, Flashback could have handled that. I, ultimately, at the end of the day, I feel like it was a little too eager to throw off the... Again, I get it. I mean, basically... Part of the idea is you can watch this movie without having watched any of the MCU before it. You can. The the I mean, if if you're like watching like who is this Loki character? What what relationship does he have with you know with Thor? You get it all in the play. You know the the and and you know even yeah if you don't know going in that Loki is masquerading as Odin, you know, you see Odin, you know, being a hedonist, and then Thor shows up, and he's like, oh, you know, 
that right there will tell you, okay, there's something going on there. And then, you know, a few minutes later, it's revealed, yes, Loki was posing as Odin. And you're told, you know, he whisked him away. To, you know, it was also really funny. I dropped him off right in the street or in the building that's now demolished. You know, that was, yeah, that was really funny. But, yeah, excuse me. If you go into this knowing absolutely nothing about the other movies at all, you can follow it. The movie explains and sets up what is, you know... I mean, one thing you won't know is how important the Tesseract is, because really, there's just the brief mention, you know, some of them are powerful, and she indicates the Tesseract, and then at the end, Loki steals the Tesseract, but at the end of the day, that's... More or less enough, you know, you, you go watch the movie and it's like, okay, so that thing's in, it's really powerful, and Loki seems to steal it at the end. Yeah, I mean, it, it could maybe have been, like, more pointed out that, yes, it is in fact an Infinity Stone, but, yeah. And, and really, I mean, Doctor Strange, you get an idea of what's going on with him. You know, you won't get the full... You know, it, it'll play very differently to people who go into this not knowing, not having watched that movie. But yeah, it doesn't really... You don't need to have watched the others to get this. But I do feel like they were... They just went, they went too far. They were too eager to th cast off the shackles of the previous entries, which I know a lot of people didn't like, but just completely going there, you know, I mean, one thing it, it at least is that him being worried about Ragnarok, that is part of what motivates him there at the start of the movie, and, and for the rest of the movie as well, but the this thing of, like, you know, eh, the Infinity Stones, you know, didn't find any, which is just so stupid. I really, I cannot believe they actually put that in the movie. I, I don't. I mean, they can't have. I'm. There's no way I'm the only person who's frustrated with that line. But, and and again, just have a brief discussion of like that would be a good place to to say, you know, the Tesseract is one. It's it's this blue cube that we have in our, you know, in this chamber. And actually, yeah, now that I think about it, you know, I mentioned the review, you know, the Odin had to activate the Destroyer. In this movie, we do see that if no one activates the Destroyer, it does not come out. She didn't even have to destroy the Destroyer or hunt the Hunter. Now, but yeah, you know, the action is fairly dynamic, fairly varied action scenes like Captain, all three Captain America movies, both Avengers movies, both Guardians of the Galaxy movies, Iron Man 3, Doctor Strange, Thor 2, and, you know, every MCU movie so far has at least one action scene with either of the following. The good guys straight up lose. Something bad happens to them or a non-powered ally of theirs. And, yeah, you know, in this, yeah, they lose early on. And... And I bet there will be several scenes like that in Infinity War. Now... Characters... One way or another, this may end up with Hulk and Thor, but that's not a huge issue, except perhaps logistically. You know, I figured they would be back on Earth, but the post-credit, the mid-credit scene in this suggests that they might not even end up like that. If, you know, the, the Comic-Con trailer for Infinity War has Thor floating through space, and then he smacks into the front, of the Guardians of the Galaxy. That was also, at first I thought, oh, is that the Guardians of the Galaxy? But then, uh, you know, then I'm like, wait, Thor's not floating through space. 
why would the Guardians of the Galaxy in encountering him like that end up with him floating through space? They're not that trigger happy, you know, so yeah. But yeah, ultimately you know, Thor can move through space. Hulk is somewhat of a different issue, you know, the and they do they are on their way to Earth, you know, so that that's also how will Hulk end up if that is Thanos? I would be very surprised if they like kill him off just like that. But I suppose maybe Thanos like traps him to to you know for the for the fun of it because he can. So he can. But uh, yeah, you know, the the I was, you know, yeah, you know, if if not either on Earth or with a very clear way to get back to Earth, which they do have, but it seems like at least Thor will end up. Actually, I suppose it's possible that Loki and Thor, like, you know, go up against Thanos and some way the other, the ship with the rest of them gets to Earth. And then, like, at that, then Thor goes through. But yeah, you know, some way Hulk, you know, yeah, I, I hope that they don't have to spend a lot of time in Infinity War getting Hulk either to Earth or to somewhere where he, you know, if, if Hulk gets to Earth, then he can get back with the other Avengers as the Infinity War begins and such. If he's like, you know, one thing I especially thought was it would really, you know, he should not at the end of the movie be on Sakaar because why would Thanos go there? Now, and yeah, you know, in, in the Plan Hulk comic, he goes back to get revenge on his supposed friends who forced him to exile. And that's a story I haven't read. Or it's the Planet Hulk, not World War Hulk. And, you know, in. Yeah. You know, Hulk. You know, Banner said, Where in the world can I go where I'm not a threat? You know, he asked Romanoff that, so he went off world. And. You know, I was also wondering if this would make you believe that he would he would return, and yeah, basically. But again, I feel like those scenes could have been stronger. And you know, beyond stopping Hella, and you know, also wondering was he happy off world? Which again, I feel like the movie should have done more to establish because that's an interesting question. Is Hulk giving up his happiness by returning to Earth because he knows he has to, or because there's some good reason for it, other than him having to. You know, in Age of Ultron, Romanoff tells Banner, they sterilize you. It's efficient. They learn from this one agent, Sidney Bristow, Irina Derevko, you know, Age of Ultron, Barton says of Quicksilver, I'll miss that quick little bastard with every arrow so far. You know, and Hulk is like, puny fire thing, not pass. Now, let's see, I suppose that covers it. Yeah, supposedly Siv had a very pivotal part in the film, and, you know, I checked, she's not in either of the upcoming two Avengers films, so, yeah, I figured she was going to die, and when Hela first attacks Asgard, I guess they just cut her death out of, yeah. And, you know, so the Nerdist News and others have theorized that Hela would be death in Infinity War, courted by Thanos, and if so, she would not die in this, but she did. I'm almost 100% certain she did die in this. 
you know, most MCU villains die in, in their first film with that. Iron Man, not the Incredible Hulk. One of them in Iron Man 2 and Thor. Captain America 1, it seems, or at least disappear and not heard from since 1940-something, as far as we've seen. Iron Man 3, Thor the Dark World. One of them in Captain America 2. Not the Winter Soldier, he starts to turn. Guardians of the Galaxy 1, Major Age of Ultron, Ant-Man. Not Civil War. Doctor Strange, one of them in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Not Spider-Man Homecoming. And, you know, Doctor Strange, I wonder if he would maybe be at the end of this film setting up Infinity War, but yeah, it was at the start of the film instead. I hope this was as fun for you as it was for me.